Thank you for that. So we're going to get started on the slides here uh, in about uh, a minute or so. We are talking about trauma-informed parenting today. This is a question that myself and Matt get asked, you know, quite a lot. Like we run, for those who don't know, a practitioner training of a, a trauma treatment modality called embodied processing. And so many of our students are parents uh, like myself and Matt. And as we go through that process, we kind of learn about trauma and about the human condition and these emotional echoes from the past and we reflect on our own life and our own history but we also can't help but reflect on those young humans that we uh, are looking after as well and wonder what have we done or not done to them that is going to affect them you know both in their life now and moving forward so it's a very important topic isn't it matt yeah 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 it's it's like foundational you know um like we can heal our own trauma but we're not going to change the world unless we change the way we, we parent, you know, unless we change the way that we raise our kids and then it'll change the next generation and keep echoing. So it has much, like much more of an impact um, to teach parents how to parent in a really, in a trauma informed way, how teach them how the nervous system develops and, you know, how the personality adapts to survive and, you know, all of those sort of things, it can, you know, have ripple effects that can last generations, you know, in a positive way. Yeah, and it's one of the reasons Matt and I are so passionate about this. Obviously, we've been through our own journey of, uh, of dysfunction and mental illness and drug addiction and then, and then healing and then to teaching other people, being trauma therapists ourselves. And, you know, it's great that we can work with these fellow adults, but we're very, very passionate about being able to help the younger generation. Because like Matt said, that positive ripple effect that that creates is so important for us as a culture. And we teach so much in EP about developmental trauma because... We really see developmental trauma as being a symptom of the way that our culture is in the West. Uh, and it's very, very important that we start to understand the points that we're going to go through today so that we can start to unwind some of that cultural conditioning around parenting and raise our kids in a trauma-informed way. So we are planning on going for around 30 to 40 minutes today. We encourage you to ask questions or, or share your thoughts as we go along. I have got a space at the end for Q&A, but I'd kind of rather answer them in the moment. So like I said, I can see the comments and we will answer them as we go along. The topic of trauma-informed parenting warrants a much longer discussion than 30 to 40 minutes. So we are going to be jumping into a few topics, you know, somewhat deeply and the rest we'll just be touching on because like I said, we it's going to be a very, very long live if we're going to go deep into everything. So uh, I'd love to hear maybe when we get to the end of this live or if you're watching the recording of this later, if there's one of the steps or one of the points in one of the steps that you want us to dive into more, uh, then let us know and we will do that because this community is all around um, sharing uh, what you all want, basically, when it comes to the topic of trauma. So let's jump into it. So the five steps, I'm just going to outline the five steps before we jump into them one at a time. So the first one is understanding trauma, emotional imprints, and the stress response. Uh, we can't start to change our behavior on things that we don't understand. What we don't understand, we are afraid of to an extent. So understanding is always the first step when we're looking to make change in any area of our life. The second step is, step is creating a space of safety, attunement, and authenticity. And we will talk all about what those things actually mean when it comes to the household and parenting when we get to that step. And then recognizing when I'm projecting my own trauma, and we all do it as parents. Just to confirm myself and Matt, we're parents as well. So we have that. I think I put in the description, you know, trauma therapist, co-creator of EP, Center for Healing, but mainly parents, <laughs> you know, uh, very, very important. Um, I have one kid, Tommy, who's turning four uh, next week. Uh, Matt has Kyson and Alia, who are four and two. And two. Or about nearly two in like a week or two. Yeah. Yep. So, um, you know, we, we do have that lived experience of having kids as well and knowing all this stuff, which can be a trap in of itself, um, uh, which I'm sure you'll find out as we go through. So projecting our own trauma, also a really important topic, working through self-blame and parent guilt. As we start to become aware of a lot of the things we're going to talk about today, uh, we no doubt starts to bring up this, this self-blame and guilt that, that every parent has to varying degrees. Uh, so we want to make a, a point of talking about that. And then also implementing in brackets, not not perfectly because we can never be perfect when it comes to parenting that in of itself is a trap uh, a trauma-informed parenting blueprint
content. So really a, a set of questions that we can ask and I really encourage when we get to that step to really write those down or take a screenshot um, and reflect on them in your own life. How we can not perfectly, but best start to implement those and really um, work through that in our own life. So let's jump into number one. So understanding trauma, emotional imprints, and the stress response. It's very important to start off start off with uh, understanding what is trauma. And those who've watched mine and me and Matt's talks before, they're like, oh, they're talking about this thing again. <laughs> yes, and we will keep talking about it probably forever because if we understand this first point, then we are well on our way to becoming a trauma-informed parent um, and trauma-informed in all areas of our life. So trauma, classically thought of in one of the many categories of trauma as acute, as a situation that is catastrophic or devastating, uh, which causes trauma to a very small selection of people in society. Um, we are here to tell you that is not the case and I'm about to bring up a list of the components of trauma. So trauma is not what happens outside of us. People think that the sexual abuse, the physical abuse, the car crash, the being a veteran away at war, the actual external thing is what the trauma is. Trauma is what happens inside of a human being as a result of external stimulus. Hence, trauma is subjective. What is traumatic for one human being may or may not be traumatic for another human being. And us humans, we love to compare our lives, what we've gone through, our traumas, and it is one of the most non-productive things we can do when it comes to this area of our life. Um, so Matt, do you want to jump into talking about the, the steps or components of trauma here? Sure. You know, like, like trauma, if we look at, at anything that activates our survival instinct, our survival response, fight, flight, freeze, fawn, <clears throat> when that energy gets activated and doesn't complete itself. You know, so that's trauma. When it gets stuck somewhere, the stress cycle gets stuck along, along its trajectory. And, you know, if we look at childhood, our parents are our source of survival, you know, so like so much of what we do and the way we parent activates our children's stress response, you know, the way we talk about emotions, the way we relate to their emotions, they can become wired to believe their emotions are threatening, you know, their emotions are a threat to their survival. So for example, you know, if a child becomes angry and the parent sh shuts it down repeatedly, then the anger can become a threat to survival. You know, it's like mum and dad don't like anger and they are my source of survival and therefore my anger is a threat to that attachment and we'll go into um, <clears throat> uh, attachment versus authenticity in a little bit. But so what, what happens is when we contract into a stress response, that emotional energy and that survival stress gets stuck in our soma, in our physical body. And, you know, you can feel it in the felt senses like density. Some people feel like they've got a brick in their belly or in their back. And, you know, you can feel it as a sort of internal activation. And so that's the stress that gets stuck. And that stress will then sprout internal narratives. And so we'll end up with belief systems and ideas and viewpoints and perspectives and narratives like stories that happen in our mind that we then view reality through and so you know if my childhood i'm constantly being put into a stress response and my environment feels threatening mum and dad feel unstable or they're highly stressed themselves or you know i'm always being told off i, I start to build a hyper vigilance in my physical body and then that sprouts into an internal dialogue you know, I have about who I am and about what the world is. And so that I then view reality through this traumatized lens, through this painful narrative. And I view myself when reflecting back on myself, I view myself with that painful narrative also. So there's something wrong with me. The world's not safe. You know, I'm not good enough. I'm not lovable. This part of me is not okay. There's essentially, there's something wrong with me. And so what we do is we split off and orphan different parts of ourselves. So we'll orphan our anger. You know, we could orphan our power, our sense of autonomy. We can orphan our creativity. We can orphan happiness and joy and positive emotions because maybe that's not allowed in the house. So it's, stop being so noisy. You know, you're too excited. And so we orphan our excitement. We push it down. And it feels like it, you know, it can feel like <clears throat> it's against the rules for me to be happy. And if I'm happy, that's threatening to my survival. And so, you know, and when trauma happens, that like so developmental trauma, I say it's any time the personality adapts to survive, 
you know anytime the personality contorts itself to survive its environment to keep relational attachment and so you know we all do that to varying degrees and when a person's personality is completely oriented around survival that i would say that's more of the top of the spectrum and these can show up as all sorts of personality traits that you know we we just take to be who we are but really they're just survival adaptations that we, we trade our authenticity in order to keep attachment to our parents and so it so much of this is about how we as parents re relate to our kids. So much so. And like Matt said, it's like we, we just decide that things, not decide, that we, we create that internal narrative that these states are, are not safe. So anger's not safe. <coughs> Sadness isn't safe because I get told I'm a sook every time I do it. Or yeah, like mm. Matt said, excitement is not safe because I'm told not to show off and you know stop, stop embarrassing me as a parent or that kind of thing. And so, so many parts of our authentic expression become not safe and so we contort and contort and contort and we kind of fit into this this box of which we'll maintain our attachment to our caregiver and then we we lose sight of who we really are on the inside and we become a functional adult in society who has all these unexpressed parts um, and then we start to manifest things later in life and that can show up as depression anxiety you know addictions drinking physical issues um, just that low level, we see it so much in, in clients that we've worked with, just that low level hum of anxiety that's kind of always there and never goes away. And um, we need to understand as a society that these states, you know, they aren't normal and they're an accumulation of a lot of these imprints that happen. And, you know, hearing that you might go, well, you know, doesn't everybody have trauma under that definition? Yes, everybody does have trauma <laughs> under that condition. Um, you know, we're not up, not up to the parent guilt part yet but you know my son tommy he has these traumatic imprints and this is you know he was born after i got into this work we'll never get it completely right or perfect it's a part of it but we can start to limit and become a better resource for our kids so they are more resilient and don't keep accumulating so much trauma that it runs into dysfunction uh later on in life yeah uh, the next one's around children being able to self-regulate and self-soothe. And one thing that, you know, a lot of parents have been taught over many, many decades, I think the narrative's starting to change now, thankfully, but it's a very, very entrenched idea, is that we need to teach children, mainly infants, um, how to self-regulate and self-soothe. Um, myself and Matt see that as a form of abuse because, and it's not the parents' fault because that's the advice they were given, but it is actually impossible for a young child and infant to self-regulate and self-soothe. That is what the attuned caregiver is there for, to help them bring them out of stress responses. And we'll talk about that in a minute when we get to the development of the nervous system. But when we are, uh, as a kid, taught how to, or not taught, but actually embodied how to come out of that stress response by an attuned caregiver, then our nervous system learns eventually how to self-soothe. A young nervous system will never learn how to effectively self-soothe by being left alone to sort it out themselves or being put in time out. That's another one that uh, a lot of parents have been told, put a kid in time out um, when they're not behaving correctly, um, which is actually going to create more of a dysfunctional nervous system than one that is resilient and can eventually learn to self-soothe. Uh, this will make more sense actually when I bring up th this next diagram around the nervous system. We've kind of already touched on the acute versus developmental trauma dot point. So we'll jump into the nervous system one. Once again, this can get a little bit confusing if you haven't um, done much nervous system research or research into polyvagal theory. But to break it down really, really simply, there are different branches of our autonomic nervous system. Uh, you'll see on the right-hand side here is the sympathetic nervous system. So these are the more active states. So think of uh, fear, anger, excitement, activation, um, that kind of energy like that. And the parasympathetic is more the suppressed or depressed uh, emotional states and nervous system states, which can look like rest. It can also look like dissociation or shutdown. Um, there are many, many branches to that parasympathetic nervous system. You'll notice down there, the middle one of those three branches coming off the PNS is the ventral vagus. The ventral just means this, that, that particular part of the vagus nerve, which is the 10th cranial nerve going from the base of our skull to basically all organs and areas of our body. When we are young, when we go into a stress response, so fight, flight, freeze, which we spoke about in the last uh, little graphic, we'll either go into a sympathetic response or a shutdown response. So as a child, we might start to scream and cry to try and get the attention of a caregiver to help us soothe, or we'll shut down and dissociate um, because it's too painful to actually be completely with the experience in that moment. 
if we have the knowledge and, and the um I suppose the resourcing within ourselves to offer it, we ideally then can help our child come out of these stress responses into the eventual vagus state, which is safety, connection, everything is okay. Um, I, I can sit there and look at my caregiver, I can hug them and breathe with them and I can come out of that stress response. So like Matt said, we don't get stuck in, in that stress. Um, one thing that can happen with kids that actually can trap a lot of people up is that a child will often firstly go into a sympathetic response. So they might be put in time out or left to cry it out or one of these kind of things. And the child is very sympathetic in that it's yelling and screaming because it fears for its survival because that's what uh, its parents it's relying on them for. And then after a while, if they're left alone, they'll all of a sudden go quiet and the parent thinks, oh, fantastic, they've learned to self-regulate or self-soothe. What they've done is they've gone into a shutdown response, what we call a dorsal vagal response, which is a dissociation um, from the pain that they are in. Uh, Matt, do you want to talk a little bit more about maybe the coming out of that cycle and how parents can do that more effectively? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Look, like uh, children <clears throat> and like specifically infants, you know, that when they're... um left alone to, to cry, the mother or the father not responding to that, to that need is it's, it's a threat to survival because if mum doesn't come or dad doesn't come, whoever's looking after me doesn't come, that means I don't have food, I don't have water, I can't even scratch my own leg, you know? It's like that level of powerlessness there. It activates all the survival responses. So the infant will go into terror, then it will go into rage, and then it'll go into complete shutdown. So if you know you look at it like a <clears throat> a mouse that's being chased by a cat, it's in a flight response, it's terror, and then it'll get cornered and turn around and have to sort of fight. So it's in rage, and then say the cat catches it in its mouth, it goes into a shutdown, it goes a limp, and that's when it stops crying. You know, every and it they call it trained helplessness. You know, you learn from a very young age you're not cared for that you know that you're helpless and so that helplessness gets embedded in the nervous system and as children get older like this changes but it really depends you know because in those first three years that's how they're being patterned that's how their nervous system's being patterned and children don't get traumatized because they get activated you know they don't get traumatized because they get hurt or have emotions or experience rage or experience distress that's not what traumatizes them what traumatizes them is when they're left alone with their distress because they haven't developed the areas of the brain that can assist in regulating out of that cycle so what happens is over and over they go into a a survival response or what can happen and they go into a survival response and then they shut down they dissociate over and over and over again and so the nervous system never learns to come out of distress and how the nervous system learns to come out of distress is via regulation with the par with the parents or with the caregivers and so <clears throat> you picture a baby's crying and then mum comes in to pick it up <sighs> it's that relief you know like even even touching on the foot you know i know when we're in the car and the like our, our daughter's crying you know their mum will reach around and hold hold her foot and you can feel that brings a level of safety of resource there she doesn't feel like she's left alone in that moment and so that helps the stress response complete itself so the issue isn't that they're crying and they're screaming the issue is when they're left alone with that because the areas of the brain start to develop by thousands and thousands of experiences of co-regulation so their nervous system it's like a sensing organ and it can sense its environment and the more it has the experience of coming out of distress, the more it has the experience of being supported, you know, to come out of distress, the more that becomes the pattern. And so, you know, that, that's the difference between someone who, you know, experiences stress as an adult, doesn't go into a full panic state, you know, like, but can make a cup of tea and just sort of <sighs> come back to relax versus someone who goes, who lives in like a state of perpetual anxiety and terror and, you know, starts using like heavy medication or goes and uses drugs, you know, shooting heroin every day just to cope with that, that level of activation that never, ever got to find completion. And so, you know, as these patterns happen, they become the way that we navigate the world. It's automatic, you know, we're, we're constantly reacting from lots of the, all these different states, you know, and some of us never get to experience a ventral connected state because we never experienced that with our parents and that's one of the things you know we won't go into it here but matt and i you know our story is one of you know a drug addiction and that kind of thing and when we finally felt that 
by doing a lot of therapy and working on a lot of these imprints, when we first felt that <sighs> everything calmed down, it was such a foreign state. I'm like, what's this? This is, what's this peace? <laughs> Contentment? What is this? And then we're like, oh, that's what I've been searching for all of these years with drugs and alcohol. I just wanted <clears> to come out of either my activated sympathetic state or my shutdown and dissociation. But I didn't know that it was available because it just wasn't patterned um, early on in life. So really important. And like a, a real world example, like I say with my son a lot, and I'm sure your parents will have this experience as well. It's like, there's this sigh and when you understand you know the nervous system you can tell kind of what's going on within the human whereas he might be having a meltdown a tantrum or something and if we're able to hold a safe space for that not shut down the anger and then eventually he'll go into my arms and he might still be crying or screaming but then after whether it's one minute or even you know 25 minutes there'll be this <sighs> and that's his system finally coming out of the stress response and if that happens over and over again, more than the other side happens where it doesn't get um, that regulation with the caregiver, then the nervous system will start to learn how to come out of that process itself. And that there's also the opposite extreme where it's like uh, protecting, over protecting a child so they don't have stress responses. That is also a form of trauma, you know, and they don't develop that um patterning in the nervous system that learns to come out of stress they develop a pattern of avoiding stress and so each time a child becomes distressed like so we look at that as a contraction uh, and it finds completion because it, the child supported through that you know that's what patterns the nervous system contract expand so stress is just as essential as coming out of stress you know like for a lot of parents who get into this sort of trauma space it's like they try to then avoid stress you know yeah. um but that's that's not helpful either no it's a great little point because you're right it's like these these states on this diagram they're all very very normal they're part of being a human <clears> being and the one trap that it's very important is that yeah, I've seen it within myself a couple of times and I have, it's like as soon as a child goes into stress, like, no, 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 like, no stress. Yeah. It's like, no, no, that's part of being human. That's part of life as well. It's not the stress, it's what happens afterwards. Yeah. Um, and this is why the first three to seven years are so important. You know, our nervous system is always adapting as humans throughout our life, but it does a lot of those, that early map of the world is created in those early years. Now, the beautiful thing about that is that we can readapt our nervous system by going back and doing a lot of, you know, deep work around these imprints and trauma and nervous system regulation later in life. But those first three to seven years are where that map's created. Yeah, so it's like, our nervous system is trying to detect threat and then determining what the best action is for that threat. And so let's say that um, anger was never safe, then I'm more likely to go into a shutdown response than express my needs or express some sort of sympathetic state because that's what was patterned early. And whereas other people have that very strong fight response and they will go into a sympathetic response. Um, but both of them tend to not know how to come out of that. And if you're thinking, yeah, I, I've got that going on, you're not alone. Most human beings uh, have that going on to some degree. And just, just quickly, I want to point out as well, like as parents, our children will then trigger our unprocessed responses. So if we have issues experiencing our anger, then our children will trigger our issues experiencing that we're experiencing like someone someone put in the comments um it's very difficult uh reparenting yourself while parenting your kids and that's essentially the journey you know because your children will bring up your your stuff they'll show you where you're still holding trauma and so we have to learn essentially to sort of have a dual awareness we have to learn to hold space for ourselves and feel what's coming up for us whilst at the same time not disconnecting from our kids and it's okay that we have stuff coming up it's okay that we get anger come up it's okay that we want to yell at them you know it's okay that we we feel that way all those are normal you know and <clears throat> Because, you know, what we can do as parents is then suppress our stuff, you know, but that's not co-regulating either, you know. Co-regulation would be being able to meet my own stuff as it arises whilst being able to hold eye contact and not disconnecting, looking away, you know. Um, and that's that's the practice, that's the journey. And there's no, you know, I don't know anyone who gets it perfect. I, I certainly don't. Me neither. Yeah. If anyone does get it perfect, let us know in the comments. We'll interview you. Um, yeah. Someone just said they are our mirrors, 100%. They certainly are. And when we can see it that way, and like Matt said, really hold space for ourselves in that process. Um, an example from my life, I remember when um, Tommy came into my life and, and early on, like Matt said, they'll bring up 
a lot of unconscious because I'd worked through a lot of stuff in my life but there's so much unconscious baggage that comes up in new life circumstances and being a parent's a very big life circumstance and I noticed there were times when he would be you know screaming and yelling and my internal the automatic reaction would be you know don't be such a sook it would just replay in my head I wouldn't say it externally but it would play in my head and then I would realize oh that's not my voice that's what I used to get told all the time when I would do that and so then I have to go through the process of really holding myself and grieving that that's the way that I was treated and also um, having compassion for my dad because he was probably told a lot worse than that when he was a kid and so we have to really yeah like Matt said have a dual awareness around yes being a trauma-informed parent and holding space for our kids but also being very aware of what's coming up for ourselves and holding ourselves like we were a kid as well. Yeah, and what gets in the way of us being the parents we want to be is our is our own childhoods, you know, our own conditionings, the way we were, so the way we adapted, and um, you know, so it is about self awareness. That's first and foremost because we can know all this stuff and sort of do it intellectually and hold down all the other parts of ourselves that you know, sort of out of alignment. But it's disembodied, you know, it's not. Uh, tuning on the nervous system level it's just like an intellectual idea that you know we've read out of a book and so the really deep work comes on ourselves it doesn't come on the way you know like we're trying to like by trying to be a good parent the real work is working on my own stuff or our own stuff yeah someone's <laughs> commented we are all imperfect humans just trying our best that sums it up so well <laughs> thank you that's beautiful Step two, safe space. So create a space of safety, attunement, and authenticity. So we touched slightly on attachment and authenticity. Um, some of you watching this may have you know, heard of this concept before, but basically attachment is everything to a child and that's to our caregivers, mum and dad or whoever the caregiver is. Uh, we will attach and that attachment equals survival. So we will do whatever we can to maintain that attachment. If part of our authentic expression uh, is a threat to that attachment, then we will choose attachment over authenticity every time. And so when, um, you know, we haven't got that trauma informed safe space, then kind of our authentic expression kind of tends to become less and less and less because we keep choosing attachment over and over again. And like we spoke about earlier, that authentic expression kind of gets squished into a box and we do our best to fit in first to the family home, then to school and then to workplace and society as a whole. And so a lot of this work as well when it comes to us is being able to work out at what points and why did I have to abandon my authentic expression and can I start to work through that um, and let that start to come out because it was shut down for a very, very good reason. There's no point beating ourselves up here. Um, but it's very important to realize that attachment is everything to a child and they will always choose that. Any points you want to add there, Matt? Uh, just like, you know, an example, you know, like if we're told, like say, like say a, a young girl gets a bad gut feeling around her uncle, doesn't sort of want to go near him, but mum and dad are like, no, you got to give him a hug, give him a kiss, you know, tell him when he says hello. She learns to ignore that gut instinct. And so, you know, fawn, it's like a please appease response. Um, and so she sacrifices that authentic gut feeling for the sake of attachment to her caregivers. And we do that over and over and over again. We lose touch with our authenticity completely and we live completely from an adaptation. You know, we live completely from a survival response. And that happens in school, that happens in the family home, that happens in culture. It, it's like it's rife with, within Western society. And, you know, I think it's only just beginning to be recognized that, um, you know, with the work of sort of Gabor Mate and stuff, how important attachment is to a child and a healthy attachment and how, how honoring and celebrating their authenticity and their uniqueness is, it's, it's so, so important. Yeah. And so when a child knows that there is a healthy resource present in the household, that's going to help them feel very, very safe in their attachment and less likely to abandon their authenticity. So when we talk about resource, resource is, is a resource of safety, one that can help us bring us out of distress and help us soothe that nervous system and bring us back into a regulated state. So the way that a, a child will look for a resource, a really good example came up a while ago from a session in our community um, when someone working on a memory where they were at home and um, 
I think they were learning how to spell or do math or something. The father was trying to um, teach them and she didn't know how to do it. And the father kept getting more and more angry and was starting to yell at her like, why don't you get it? And, and wouldn't let her get up as she was trying to get up out of the chair in the lounge room. And there was a moment which was, illustrates it so well. And it's, she was saying, I sat on the chair and my father's right here yelling at me. And all I was doing was looking around for mum and mum wasn't home at the time. That's the child looking for a resource. They want to find something to help bring them out of that stress response um, in the face of threat. Now, one of the things that happens in the household is the people that should be being a solid resource and bringing us out of stress response are the ones causing the stress. <laughs> so, it, yeah. it's, it, and that's where we get tripped up a lot, right? But the child will always look for a resource. It'll always want to be coming out of that response. Um, so it's very, very important to note that. But there are unfortunately many, many unacceptable emotions and behaviors happening uh, in a household. We've got overcoupling there in brackets. So overcoupling, an example that we use a lot is one of anger. We'll bring up anger time and time again because anger is such a shut down emotion um, as a culture in our society. And it's no wonder that as we grow up, so many people are struggling with this fawn response, being people pleasers, putting everybody else first, abandoning themselves, then running into health issues. Uh, it's because there's such a great shutdown in most people um, of that emotion. And so what happens if that's patterned when we're younger, if, if anger was unacceptable, then if that's patterned enough times, when we're an adult now, 20, 30, 40 years later, whenever a situation uh, elicits anger within our system, even if we could give a healthy anger response of just stating a boundary and saying no, once that anger reaches a certain level, the nervous system and the emotional body, the subconscious, will shut down that anger and say not safe and will go into a shutdown response and not express our needs. Uh, we have this going on not just with anger but with other emotions as well purely because there were unacceptable emotions uh, within the household. So it can be sadness, can be joy, can be guilt, can be all sorts of things. The shutting down of a child's positive emotions, we uh, have chatted about this a little bit already, but um, it's an important one to note. Um, so many parents, you know, get embarrassed of their child's behaviors or they want to, you know, make them just fit into the crowd. And um, this, once again, is shutting down that expression uh, of the child. Um, this is sort of one of my life. It was like, Ryan, stop boasting. Ryan, stop showing off. And so once I grew up and got older, as soon as I would start to get somewhat excited and express myself, I would have this shutdown response, which I'd, you know, stop it not safe. Hence why I would use drugs and alcohol a lot because then that mechanism would go away and I would actually express myself uh, in a way that I wish I could when I was sober. Um, once again, the, the, the thing that we deem the problem isn't the actual problem. Um, punishment, reward and the drug of approval. I love the term drug of approval. I think I heard this uh, first when I was listening to the book Awareness by Anthony DeMello. Um, when he was speaking about how our parents unconsciously, not their fault, unconsciously uh, get us hooked on this drug of approval at a very, very young age where we're trying to make up for this perceived lack of approval by our parents from the rest of our lives. And I've worked with, you know, 50 year old men whose dads have been dead for over a decade, but most of the actions they take in their life are still trying to impress their father because they got hooked on that drug of approval at a very, very young age. It's one that we get praised and loved and we get affection poured on us when we achieve certain things as opposed to just being who we are. You know, I try and make a point of going up to Tommy when he's sitting on the couch doing nothing and telling him how much I love him um, and how much he doesn't, it doesn't have to change. Whereas a lot of us, when we grew up, it was only when there was an achievement. I got an A on the test. I kicked four goals at football or some sort of achievement-based thing. And this is how that, that drug of approval can start at a very young age. Uh, Matt, do you want to touch on attunement and co-regulation in the household? Yeah, yeah. Look, I, I think we sort of touched on it already with the co-regulation part. Um, some, someone, I think it ties into someone's question. Oftentimes, there is disconnect on my end dealing with my own trauma, and yet my daughter wants the attachment. But I totally disconnect and shut down. How can attachment and safety be created in a situation like this for a child where a parent is activated, but a child is not? Both need safety. And it, it's really, really difficult. It comes back to what I was talking about when our own stuff, you know, can get activated and the compulsion to sort of disconnect. Um, you know, something I personally try to do is hold eye contact, you know, whilst holding space for myself, have my child in that space and, you know, consciously remaining connected to them. Talk to them, tell them it's not your fault, you know, and stay right there present with them you know it's like if i've got anger coming up i try to hold eye contact you know and look at look at my kids in the eye whilst i'm fully feeling my anger you know so it gives that sense of being connected because it is the sort of disconnect 
you know, that, that's the issue. It's not the actual anger that's the issue. And so, you know, firstly, cultivating awareness around that. Because if we're aware that we're disconnected, we can consciously choose to reconnect, you know. Um, <clears throat> and if we're overwhelmed to the point, you know, we can't, um, like we can't reconnect, you know, because that can also be an issue. If we're overwhelmed to that point, I, I would say get some help with a one-on-one -on -one therapist, you know, one-on-one -on -one somatic therapist. I've also seen some people, if, if their children are kind of old enough and mature enough and, and able to have that conversation, is just being really open and saying, you yeah. know, I understand what's happening for you, but also when you go into that state, this is what's happening for, to me. And I, I, I would love if we could, you know, tackle this together. And that often will look like professional help and that kind of thing. But I've seen some families really heal together in that space. And I think that's really beautiful. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. communicating with the kids, tell, being honest, you know, talking to them about it, because otherwise they believe it's about them. They create an internal narrative like there's something wrong with me. Mum won't look at me. Mum doesn't love me. I'm unlovable. I'm not good enough. Blah, 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 blah. And so, you know, talking to them about that when we've got stuff coming up. You know, I always say to my son, oh, dad's got a lot of anger in his belly at the moment. Yeah, you know, like that's beautiful. I say it all the time. <laughs> yeah, beautiful. Um, someone just asked the book, so Awareness by Anthony DeMello. So I think it's D-E space M-E-L-L-O. Um, that'll be close enough though if you Google it. Um, so in the womb, I'll just touch on when does attunement and co-regulation start? It starts in the womb. So for those tuning in who are thinking about having children or maybe there's one on the way, that, that process actually starts in the womb. There's so much good research around uh, in utero development right now. You know, babies that are, uh, the parents had a very, very stressful pregnancy are born with higher levels of cortisol, the stress hormone in the system. Um, so very, very important that we can attune to our child even though they haven't joined us outside in the physical world uh, just yet. Um, really, really important. And with attunement, it, it's something that we, if we haven't been taught, we really have to work on ourselves because our children, even at a very, very young age, it's, it's automatic and very natural for them to attune to us. That's what they're doing most of the time. They're attuning to their environment and the people around <laughs> them. And in those early years, it's mainly the primary caregivers and they're assessing, even though they don't know it logically, they're assessing our emotional states. Is dad angry? Is dad okay with me? Is dad safe at the minute? Is dad approachable at the minute? All of that is being assessed. Um, unfortunately, as adults, we're in our busy, busy society. We're on our phones. We're doing all sorts of stuff. And we're not even attuned to our own emotional states, let alone our own and our child's. <laughs> okay? And that's what, we're trying, that's what we're trying to be. When a child can feel completely seen in their emotional state and also understand their parents' emotional state, that's what's so good for Matt to say when he's angry, like dad feels angry in the belly right now and making that okay. That's even attunement. If Matt's feeling anger or I'm feeling anger, as opposed to us being just completely safe all the time, as it's very, very important that we try not to create those unacceptable emotions. So um, attunement should start right off the bat. Actually, attunement should start when you're thinking about kids. I'd get very, very attuned <coughs> with your partner and try and work through all the baggage that you might have in the relationship before you even start conceiving kids. That's how early I believe attunement should start. Really, really important. Um, so, so much for keeping to half an hour, Matt. No yeah, yeah, yeah. I was, I was about to remind you that we were planning on just speaking on two of the two of the dot points instead of all of them. Uh, we're not going to. Let's keep rolling. Let's keep rolling. Well, we, <laughs> so we've touched on projection. Okay, so uh, being able to recognize when we're projecting our own trauma. We have touched on this a bit, so we'll, we'll try and skip through this one a little bit faster. So <clears> we all have a parenting blueprint. Right? And, and it may be conscious, unconscious. Normally, it's mostly unconscious and it gets revealed to us as we do have kids. But we do have some sort of parenting blueprint based on what we saw. Yes, mostly from our caregivers, our parents, but also what we saw at a young age you know, with our, par um, our friends when we'd go to their house and see their parents, things we'd seen on television, um, the way we saw our siblings getting raised in the same household. Uh, we create this blueprint and then all of a sudden as we become a parent, we start to implement that blueprint. It's very, very important to know and it's keys with the theme that we're talking about here. As parts of our blueprint arise that we maybe see aren't going to be beneficial for ourselves as our kids, we need to start to dive quite deeply into that blueprint where it came from and how we can show up in a different way because so many of us not just with parenting with anything we're mostly reacting to life and we're reacting on blueprints past imprints that have happened to us in our conditioning phase as we bring that to awareness and start to unwind those we can make different choices around how we want to act in a certain situation so one question to ask is 
in the home with my kids, what emotions or states can't I handle? Really, really important. What are those states? Is it anger? Is it, um, you know, when I see my child at the playground not standing up for themselves because that brings shame on me because it reminds me of when I used to do that or when my father made me try and stand up for myself. Start to become aware in these interactions that you have with your kids but also when you're watching them play or interact with others. What states bring up that visceral reaction inside of you? What can't you handle? Because what you can't handle in them is something that you can't handle within yourself. Once again, this comes back to the comment someone left earlier about them being a mirror. Behavior, same thing. What behaviors trigger me? What are the family patterns that you have? So many people, we, we think that things are genetic, but more often than not, that these patterns are passed down through the programming that we get and these imprints that echo from the past. So what family patterns show up? You know, Did you see your father every time that he was stressed, he would drink beer? So now I have part of my blueprint is how do I deal with stress? I escape, I drink beer or whatever other coping mechanism it is. If my child sees that, that'll become their blueprint for how stress is dealt with within the world. So very, very aware that we're not only acting out our blueprint, we're also creating the blueprint for the next generations. Someone said, yes, shadow work, it definitely is uh, shadow work. Um, unconscious, uh, sorry, suppressed and expressed rage, but we keep bringing up anger and rage. Um, very, very important that as as anger and rage starts to get brought up within our, our parenting, and it will, no doubt about that, it will. It's a tough job, right? <laughs> let's, let's not lie, it's a tough job. Um, we, we need to work out, you know, how much of that is a logical or rational amount of anger and how much do I feel like, you know, a lid's coming off a, a jack-in-the-box inside me? So a lot of times parents do have to go off and do that one-on-one work and work through a lot of unexpressed rage. Um, I used to, Early on, I remember with Tommy, early on when I'd go visit my parents and I'd maybe see, I hope mum's not watching, but <laughs> <laughs> parent guilt coming your way, mum. Um, uh, well, it would be very, very unconscious, but I'd see the way my mum would act with Tommy or speak to him and bang, it would bring up all this stuff from my childhood that I hadn't thought about in decades. And I'd get all this oh, massive amounts of rage coupling up. But then I would go away and own that as my own and work through that. The natural thing that people want to do is start telling them, stop talking to them that way, stop doing that, stop doing that. Deal with it within yourself first. Otherwise, you're going to overreact to a situation that doesn't warrant it. What are some of the unconscious just, beliefs? Just, uh, wait, 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 wait. Quickly add to that, you know, rage, it's like, or anger in, in general, it's like not a bad thing. Like feeling anger is, it's like, it's our power, you know, it's, it's aliveness. It, it, it heal, it's healing, you know, anger is such a healing emotion to fully heal. I mean, to fully feel, you know, it's when it's uncontained and it's reactive that it causes damage, you know, like it, 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 expresses outwardly and hurts those around us but when it's contained when we can fully feel it in our body it's like life you know it's our autonomy it's our will it's our power it's what makes us able to set boundaries and say no and so when we can fully own and experience our anger we can say no very firmly but very cleanly you know it's when it's kind of exploding outwards and and uncontained when we're not present you know, when we're not fully present to it, then it can really, really do damage. And so the, you know, the um, journey for me has never been about getting rid of anger. It's just about learning to fully feel it, you know, learning to fully allow it and contain it and stay present with it. And I think that's what sort of transmutes it and transforms it. And just becoming aware of these unconscious beliefs around how kids should be raised, you know, and that'll pop up as well. There's so many... (laughs) You know, a, a little while ago, I remember Melissa came home and she bought Tommy something and I'm like, yeah, you can't buy him something every day. And I said, you should check in with that. Go, Is that true? <laughs> you got that one too? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. It's yeah. like, and, and now I may do some reflection on that and decide that maybe that is something that I believe is true and discuss it. But I need to actually check in with myself and go, hang on, is that just something that I've heard? Is that something that I was told when I was younger? Why do I believe that? So it's very, very important to check in around these unconscious beliefs. Uh, control is fear and fear is the opposite of love. So many parents that we speak to are trying so hard to control (coughs) their children, control their behaviors. Control is always going to come from a place of fear. If we're coming from a place of fear, then our children with their natural attunement that they have, they will pick up on that and that's not going to be a place of healthy co-regulation. Okay. So controlling is a big one. Just like the opposite, the opposite extreme of that is zero boundaries. 
know, um, which is another huge problem. I, you know, I, I see, and especially as we sort of get into this, like parents will completely give up control, like it's a free for all. The kids can do whatever they want, but that's having a lack of boundaries. Um, so just beware of falling, compensating to the other extreme. You know, um, and I know this because you know, falling and falling into different stuff myself at different times. Yeah, it could be another form of of that fawn or people pleasing response. Um, avoidance. Is, avoidance. Yeah, yeah. So it's like a, a lack of boundaries can show up with our children, and we we have this yeah. idea that well, if it's a boundary, I'm going to be overly aggressive. I'm going to be you know, it's yelling. We have these yeah. ideas in our head, but it's a healthy boundary and healthy anger is not. It doesn't show up that way at all. It's a, yeah, it's well, and it comes back to, you know, fear of anger and rage itself or suppression of my own rage. So then I won't put in the proper boundaries, you know, that are needed for safety in the household. And so we shut down our rage and we go into a fawn response and it's like, oh, I'm not going to control them. I'll just let them completely be authentically who they are, you know, whilst they're sticking a fork in the PowerPoint. It's like, you know what I mean? Like this extreme example, but, you know, it's like, it can go to that complete other extreme, which is just the other side of the coin. It's the please and appeal or the fawn response. Um, so integrating anger is essential, you know, I would say in, in, in that area. If people want to understand what integrated anger looks like, the, the movie V for Vendetta, it's a great movie, by the way. Natalie Portman plays a character in that and um, she goes through um, this, this heavy trauma and she goes through this kind of integration process of, of anger and rage and it's she did so incredibly well like as an actress to see it right at the end she's about to send this train to uh parliament house i think it is to blow it up and she's she's in the train and the policeman comes holding a gun at her and she's about to like put it into forwards and he goes step away you know from the control and she looks at him in the eye and she just says no and it's like, it's, I'm getting chills thinking about it. For those who haven't watched it, please watch it. But it is such a great example of, the, of integrated anger. It's not, ang it's not aggressive. It's not our classical ideas of anger. It's a no that is 100% authentic and is meant. And it's so powerful, you can, you can feel it watching it. Um, last top point here, forgetting who you are and losing yourself in the role of parent. Happens so often. So many, so many mums out there. Um, without kind of stereotyping, so many mums tend to lose themselves uh, in the role of a parent. Um, another movie reference, I don't know, I've never really do movie references, but I'm doing two in a row. Um, the Shift, uh, wonderful movie. I encourage that you all watch it if you haven't. Um, there's a few characters in that. It kind of goes through their journey of questioning who they are and their values in life. Uh, it's a Dr. Wayne Dyer movie. And um, there's this mum of two who's clearly lost herself in that role. And she starts to remember how she used to paint and be an artist when she was younger, but she hadn't done it since she was a parent. And she's on a walk. She's sort of having these, asking these deeper questions and on a walk with her kids and the husband in nature. And she stops and just gets completely lost in a trance, staring at these trees. And the kids are yelling at her. And one of the kids runs up to her and says, mum, what are you doing? And she think, oh, she said, I'm just thinking how I would paint these trees. And she goes, you don't paint trees, mum. Like he thought paint on the tree. She goes, no, no, like a, a picture, a painting. And the kid says, you don't paint, mum, and then run off. And she has this epiphany that her own children don't actually know who she is because all she has become is a parent. So it's very, very important that we have um, values, hobbies, identities outside just the role of being a parent. Otherwise, <laughs> we'll lose, lose ourselves. And that's when empty nest syndrome and all that stuff comes into play as well. Fourth step, parent guilt, working through self-blame and parent guilt. Matt, why do we blame and guilt ourselves as parents? Why do we, we do it? Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, it, it's an interesting one. It's because like we, we get it come up. Like I don't know a parent who doesn't have, have guilt, you know, but like we can use it as an alarm clock to sort of see what we can do better. You know, the, I think there's a difference between wallowing and shame and having guilt, like guilt can be a healthy emotion, like, oh, you know, maybe I was a bit harsh then, you know, or... Um, it shows that we have oh, morals and we care, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. You know, like, oh, maybe I did overstep that boundary just then, or, you know, maybe my own stuff got projected in that situation, or, you know, like, um, you know, I, I was in overwhelm and I didn't handle that, you know, the way I spoke to my son or daughter um well in that situation and so we can get guilt you know i think there's a big difference between that guilt because the guilt can be like an alarm clock that says you you know you need to be aware of something you know look there's something to look at um within yourself but 
then what tends to happen, and this comes from our own trauma, you know, being shamed as children, is we then internalize that external shaming and we wallow in shame. You know, there's something wrong with me. We think it's a reflection about who we are. You know, so that behavior that we did, you know, maybe we spoke a bit harshly to our child, it then becomes a sense of self. You know, it's like there's something wrong with me. I'm a terrible parent. You know, I didn't, like, I'm never going to get this right. Look at Matt and Ryan. They're probably so perfect. And we compare ourselves to ideals, you know, of other people that we see around. And, you know, we project all these good qualities onto other people and sit with this sense of shame and deficiency in ourselves. That's unhealthy. I would say guilt, you know, that initial guilt, if we use it as like an alarm clock to look, there's something here. You know, then we're... then the parent-child relationship is a catalyst for transformation. You know, we stay connected. We're able to transform ourselves and do better, you know, and keep growing through the mistakes rather than sort of, you know, use it to marinating in the misery of our, of, our, of our shame, you know, which is just, like I said, a, like a, a pattern, a, a pattern from, from external shaming when we're children. Yeah, and so blame will keep us stuck. Blame will get us stuck on a loop. And many parents fall into it where it's just constantly fixating on all the things that we could have done better or the things that we perceive we should have done but didn't. And we just get stuck on that loop. And so our, I suppose, orientation then comes from a place of this guilt and shame and fear. And, and you know, so, so many people ask, it's like, how do I interact, you know, with my children? Me and Matt did a course uh, years ago for families or loved ones of people who have addiction. And so many of the questions we get is people want to know, what exactly do I say to them? Like, what do I do around them? It's like they want some prescription. They want a script. Okay, let's, let's get Ryan and Matt's script out. The intent and the place that you're coming from is far more important than actually what is said. And most people, I'll keep using the example of an addicted loved one, are coming into it from a place of fear. They're coming into it from a place of not understanding. They're coming into it for a place of thinking that that person's broken and needing to fix them. And so coming from that place of of deficiency in many ways, no script is going to matter because the person will unconsciously pick up on that and you will meet resistance. And that happens with our kids as well. The kids will pick up on the place the, emotionally that where we're coming from and we'll get met with resistance. When if we said the exact same words coming from a place of understanding, compassion, healthy, integrated anger and boundaries, then we'll get met with a different reaction because the underlying energy has changed. Yeah, it's, 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 you know, it's about authenticity. You know? Authentically coming from what whatever's going on within me, you know, and telling telling the truth, you know, because we can come from our own adaptations and our own fears and our own insecurities and what it means about me that my child's acting that way and you know a real self centered way of looking at it. But when we sort of learn to be aware of our own stuff and what's coming up within us, we can stay connected and and speak to them from a much more authentic way. And, you know, I've worked with thousands of addicts. I've lived with thousands of addicts. I've met thousands of addicts' parents. And, you know, the most often, uh, sorry, the, the most common thing I see is when parents make it about themselves and they're trying to change their addicted loved one because they believe it means something about them. I, I remember when we first met, I think it was you who said, um, you know, like, it's like we'll go through all the addicted loved ones, like, you know, all the things they've done, like, oh, they've stolen my money, they've broken into the house, and they've done this and that and that, and then the neighbors found out, you know. It was like when someone else found out, you know, it reflected badly on them, and that's the worst thing. And we can be coming from those insecurities, you know, and those places of self-centeredness without even knowing it, being completely unconscious to it. Yeah, that was uh, one of the mums that came into the center. And it was like she brushed over. It's like, oh, for the last months. So like, yeah, no, and she did this and she broke this and she's been stealing. She's been using intravenously and, you know, sleeping around and blah, blah, blah. But I've come in today to get her help because now the family knows about it. It's like, oh, yeah, for yeah. fuck's sake. Um, so it's a story I heard years ago. I can't remember who the teacher was, but they're talking about, you know, the, the father who gets the phone call from the school and says, oh, you know, young Jimmy, we found drugs in his locker and we're going to need you to come in um, to the school. And the first reaction is, how could he do this to me? Yeah. That's what we do yeah, as parents. Yeah. Yeah. How could he do this to me? Does that help your son in this situation? Are you serving the moment or are you serving your own 
stories, your narratives, or what, what the world's going to think about you. And we fall into this very, very unconsciously because once again, culture indoctrinates us with wanting everyone to see us as perfect or see us in some sort of good light. And that, and that comes back down to like the survival instinct because tribal mentality, like we needed our tribe to survive, you know, for thousands of years. And the way we were viewed by our tribe, by the people in our village was essential, you know, that we were viewed well for our survival so we could have that connection because we relied on the community. And that's showing up now as how could my son do this to me because he's got drugs in his locker, you know. It's like I'm being viewed a certain way because of my son's actions and that's threatening to my survival. So it's like a collective kind of trauma that carries through. I'm just imagining the son going, I don't even like drugs. I don't even want to do them, but I'm going to do them just because I know that's going to annoy dad the most. Yeah. <laughs> um, so uh, ignorance, is, ignorance isn't bliss. A lot of people start to understand this stuff and go, oh, I wish I didn't know this because now I'm reflecting so much on my own childhood and that of my kids. Uh, it's not bliss. Uh, it can be a bit of a shake up to the system, but it's very, very important. If we want to change the way that we parent and show up for our kids and ourselves, we need to understand and know this stuff first. We can't um, put it back in the box and just hope things change because it won't. Uh, forgiveness and the learning process, very, very important when it comes to removing uh, self-blame and parent guilt. So finding the right support and working through that. So a lot of parents, it's important that we, we do do that one-on-one -on -one work if it's necessary or we find you know those groups uh, and there's, there's many groups around of parents who are going through something similar and we can start to not wallow with them but learn from each other. Okay, we might want to express things that need to come out, but then we want to ideally learn from each other and work out, hey, what am I going to do with my parenting blueprint from now, uh, as opposed to spending 90% of my time just wallowing in, in guilt from the past. No, it reminds me of Rumi's, uh, like I'm paraphrasing because I can't remember the exact words, but like the medicine is in the wound. You know, if like I have a problem where I'm constantly raging at my kids, you know, um, then my rage is the medicine you know it's but it's learning to consciously stay present with the felt sense of the rage you know that's the remedy it's like we go into the very thing that we believe is the problem and that transforms it it transforms it at the roots otherwise we can make superficial changes um you know and and i would say this point that you know like of doing our own work is the foundation without that the changes are only going to be superficial and there's going to be no actual embodied attunement with our kids so our own transformation and our own trauma work working through our own childhood it's like if we just did that and didn't even know any of this it's like this would be a natural result of that you know um, and we learn to understand how we were affected by our own childhood. So then we understand how our behaviors affect our own children. And it's, it becomes an experiential understanding rather than just reading a book on parenting and then trying to implement all the things we've learned. It's about transformation, you know, um, deep transformation. And that's, that, that's what creates the ripple effect. You know? So the mother who brought her son to see Gandhi and there was a line, she had to wait for like three or four hours to go in and see him. And she finally, they waited all day. They were going to go home, but they waited and they went in. And she said, Gandhi, my son is eating far too much sugar and he's getting unhealthy and <clears throat> overweight and, and I want him to stop. Can you please tell him to stop? And Gandhi goes, no, I'm not going to do that. Please come back in one month. And she's like, oh, it's ripped off. That sucks. I'll come back though. It's Gandhi. So she waited, literally waited a month. Lined up again, three to four hours a month later, walked in to see Gandhi. Gandhi looked at the kid and goes, stop eating sugar. And she goes, why didn't you tell him that a month ago? I waited a month. I've waited in line twice. He goes, I needed to make sure that I couldn't eat sugar for a month before I told him. <laughs> right? So most of us as parents, we're telling our kids what to do, trying to control their behavior when we're not doing the same things ourselves. And that is not an embodied place to come from because we've all yeah. probably heard this, but kids aren't looking, listening to what we're saying and they're watching how we are being. And that's how they are modeling themselves in the world. Yeah, definitely. You know, um, it's, it's, yeah, we hold them to higher standards than we hold ourselves a lot of the time. Yeah. And we say it's because we want them to do better than us and all of that sort of stuff, but we don't know the motives of where we're coming from. A lot of that comes from self-centered desires. Absolutely. So take a screenshot of the blueprint here or write them down. I encourage you to, you know, have these in a journal or a document somewhere. Um, I would love for you to check in with these. I'll be aware of my emotional states that trigger me. I'll be aware of when I'm trying to control or fix. 
I'll be aware when I'm feeling guilt around my parenting. I understand my attachment style. Um, for those who don't know, you can Google attachment styles. You can Google attachment style quiz and see whether you have a secure and anxious and ambivalent, avoidant uh, attachment style. And oh, then you'll, yeah, well, then you'll start to know because attachment shows up not just in our uh, relationships with friendships or relationships in um, intimate relationships, but also in the relationship uh, with our children as well. Um, I'll create a self healthy and safe container in the home or I'll do my best at starting to cultivate that. I will normalize negative and positive emotions. Um, they're all part of our expression as a human being. Um, I will honor my uniqueness outside of my role as a parent. That's a really important one for a lot of people. Start to write down, who am I? If I wasn't to identify myself as a parent, then who am I? And a lot of people just stare at a blank page when they're asked to do that. Um, very, very important. And I will become an authentic example by embodying this work myself, which is what we just spoke about um, just before. So I encourage you to write that down. I'd love to, if you reflect on those and feel comfortable, I'd love you to share them in the group or underneath this video as you do that. But now I've got to run in a minute, so we've got to be quick here. Um, yeah, yeah, cool. I left this slide in here. Um, this is one when Matt, Matt and I are doing a presentation about embodied processing we have in here. So this is actually in the context of uh, practitioner and client, one that, an orientation that we like to teach our prax to bring into session, but it's so, so apt for uh, dealing with children as well. And that is all is welcome here. All of you is welcome here. If the child feels like, all parts of them are welcome in the household, then they are not going to fear their attachment being taken away and they're going to feel safer to be authentic. I'm not here to fix you. You're not broken. Once again, this isn't all you can tell them this, but this is more of an orientation. This is when we're speaking about coming from the right place as opposed to saying the right things. This is a beautiful intention and energy to come from when dealing with our kids. Uh, I'm not here to fix you. You're not broken and all parts of you are welcome here. We notice it time and time again in an embodied processing session, as soon as those words by the practitioner are uttered, all of you is welcome here. It's like the room calms down to an extent because we're so, we have our guards up basically all the time um, trying to not show certain parts of us. When we realize all of those parts are okay, then we can relax into who we really are. So just to finish up here really quickly, um, mine and Matt's, you know, life's works in body processing, teaching around the topics of trauma and addictions and the subconscious and working somatically in the body and trauma healing and spirituality, all of that kind of stuff. So check out Embodied Processing if you want to dive into our work more deeply. I'll get AJ to put the link to that in the comments right now if anyone wants to check that out. And these are just the inclusions of the training. I won't spend too much time here, um, but check that out if you are interested. We do have a uh, full pre-training called a Somatic Therapy Masterclass on that as well. Um, unfortunately, I do have to run, so I haven't got too much time for Q&A. What we will do is later, I will go through any of the questions in the comments that haven't been answered, and I will answer them in some way. And if it's something that we need to dive into in some detail, then we'll make that a topic for the next class that we do. So... Big thank you to everybody all over the world who has joined us today. Uh, really appreciate the input. Um, lots of energy in the comments, which we absolutely love. And um, we hope you've taken some sort of value out of this. If you are watching the replay later on, just put hashtag replay and uh, make any comments or questions that you have and we will get back to you. Um, someone just asked, can you send through the somatic pre-training? Uh, AJ, if you can send that through, otherwise I'll find that um, a little bit later when I come back to my computer. So Matt, <clears throat> Pleasure as always, my friend. Thanks. Thank you, everybody, and we'll see you all next time.